All right, grab your Bibles. Go to John chapter number 11. Last week, we started a series on hope that we're going to continue today. Hey, I know this isn't your typical, let's go through the Christmas story. We'll do that on Christmas if God continues to lead that way. All right, but right now, I feel like God's got us in this. And I believe today, somebody in the room needs something from this today. I firmly know a lot of you in your situations that can very much benefit from today what we're going to talk about. And so I hope you'll take notes, right? Get your phones out, get a tablet, I'll get something out. Get your Bibles out, write in it. Um, we say this all the time. You'll never remember everything you hear, but you will remember the things you took time to write down. Would you agree with me that the written word is the most powerful word you have in your life today? If you don't believe in that, then, then, then let me argue with the Bible. Without the written word, where would we be? And so aren't you glad that people didn't just walk around with Jesus and watch his miracles, that they actually stopped and wrote about him? Aren't you glad that, that they, they didn't just behold the cross and then it was story after story of people making up their own version. Instead, they stopped and they wrote about it. I'm going to tell you right now, God's working in your life and the Holy Spirit's moving. It would do not only you good, but it would do future generations good for you to write down the things that God's telling you. All right. And so I showed um, our Monday night class. I've got this tote. To me, it's my most prized possession. Um, I, I don't have many things of value, but this thing to you may be value less, but to me, it's priceless. Um, it is journal after journal. I probably got about 15 notebooks that are yay thick that are mostly full of all the things that God has given me over the years that I've written down. And, and to me, it's the one thing I want my kids to have when I die. It's the one thing I want them to go through. They don't need to hear, you know, dad accomplished this in real estate and dad accomplished this with the church. They need to get into the studies of what God accomplished in dad's heart. And so I have those things and I keep them close. Uh, now I've converted, I'm doing digital files. Um, that way, if they have the cloud, they have me forever. They can lose the book and still have what God's doing. Uh, I, I, I love using the technology to, to move forward and, and to be able to keep and document anywhere in the world I can access and go back to what God has shared with me. I would challenge you to get a healthy habit of making record of what God's doing in your life. All right. And so if you come to Monday night with our teenagers, we give them all notebooks. Now, some of them doodle the whole time, but I, I don't get on to them because I know that I learn while doodling. That's my best listening. I got to be doing something with my hands. Anybody else need a fidget spinner? All right. You know what I'm talking about? All right. And so um, it, it, we give it to them. We put it down. And every now and then I, I go through their books and I know that um, that might be an invasion of privacy, but I, I go through, they, they leave them here. So they leave them in our possession and, and I'll look and they'll be doodle, 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 one sentence. And that one sentence always tears me up. You know why? Because that means that, wow, God got me right there. He got my heart. And my heart, my prayer is that that is ingrained in their hearts. Today is one of those that we're continuing. Remember last week, uh, let's go to verse number 17 of, of John chapter number 11. We ended with Thomas, right? The twin, where, where Jesus had just said to his disciples, let's go wake him up. And let's go wake him up. And we pre preached about a hope that wakes people up. And we tried to challenge you. I had you write down a name of somebody in your life that did not know the Lord. And I hope that you've made contact with them this week. I hope that you've planted a seed. Hey, by the way, your first contact doesn't have to be all about Jesus, but keep this in your mind. It might be your last contact. So make sure Jesus is in there somewhere, right? Um, you don't know when your, only, your, your last conversation with somebody is. I, I, I hugged with somebody this morning whose 24-year-old brother died this week. Uh, and, and, and I know this to be true, that the death is no respecter of person. Um, and, and I think we take for granted our relationships way too much. And so understand this. You might take for granted your relationship, but don't take for granted their eternity. All right. And so I, I hope that you've contacted those persons. And we use this as a, hey, we're in a lost and a sick and a hurting world and they need to be woken up. Would you agree? I think the church needs to wake up too. Um, there needs to be some excitement in your life about what God has done. I'm not standing up here today in a representation of an easy life. Life is difficult. Um, I, 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 I have bad days quite often and, and, and difficult times. How many of you in here face the devil on a daily basis? Raise your hand, all right? Yeah, bad days too. I was thinking about this. We voted DJ in as our pastor of Restoration Recovery Ministries last week. And it was like, you know, he's so moody, it's in his name, right? Like it's Pastor Moody, all right? The thing is, no, I'm just joking. But the thing is, is hey, you're gonna go through battles. You're gonna have those difficulties. The word of God is the constant you can stand on. And we need a, a church that's excited about God's words, not what everybody else has had to say about God, not what everybody else is telling you to believe about God or other people, but instead what you're developing in your relationship with God on a daily basis. And so I told you last week, we're going to break down this st study over three different periods. One, we were going to look at the three different groups of people that Jesus had contact with. So I told them in their notes, write Jesus on the side and then draw lines. And we're going to develop relationships. Last week, we talked about Jesus in this story, John 11, with the disciples. He was teaching them to evangelize. 
teaching them to believe that God has resurrecting power. May the church never forget that we serve a God that does not create graves, but instead empties them. All right, now I want you to understand this. You're saying, oh yes, there's gonna be a rapture. I firmly believe that if you are lost today, the Bible says you are dead in your trespasses and sins. In other words, you're not experiencing God's abundant life like we learned about in John chapter number 10. You're actually experiencing a defeated life. You're not living your purpose. You don't have the joy. You don't, you say, well, I like my life. Okay, if you like your life without Jesus, try Jesus and I guarantee you, you will love your life and you won't go back. Now, it's not meaning that life's going to be easy with Jesus because it's definitely not. It just simply means that it's easier to have help and especially the help of the Son of God who has power over every demon in hell, all right? And has power over the enemy that so wants to kill and to destroy you. Remember John 10, 10? He said, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came so that you could have abundant life. I mean, I came so that you could truly live. And so you can be very much alive in your body, breath in your lungs, but dead in your spirit. I, you agree? How many of you have ever had the day you wish would just, yeah, you, you've never had? You wish it would go away. You wish you could take it back. How many of you have ever experienced that? That's a dead day. Would you agree? The Bible says this. Paul says we actually have to come to the end of ourselves. In Galatians, he teaches us that we are crucified with Christ, but now we live, but it's not us that lives. It's Christ that lives in us. If we're not alive, but Christ is alive in me, that means that I have put my flesh to death. In other words, hey, the best day of your life is the day that you spiritually die so that Jesus can spiritually resurrect you. That's called salvation. You agree with that today? All right, so understand this, that God is not walking up to your enemies today with condemnation. God is not walking up to the person that hates you or trolls you on Facebook or Twitter. And God is not walking up to a Democrat or a Republican to give judgment. God is walking up today with grace. We sing it. Your mercy and goodness, they give me assurance. But we think that's for us. We forget it's for everybody else. And in this today, I know that there are people that you love, that if we are to look at it from a spiritual lens, they are dead. They are addicted. They are afflicted. They are hopeless. How many of you know someone that is going through something right now that has a hold on them? That's the way the world would say. How many of you know somebody like that? Slip your hand up. How many of you love that person? Keep that hand in the air. How many of you desire that person's freedom? Desire them to to experience God's goodness. Desire them to see the resurrected life. Okay, understand this today. We're gonna deal with this. Mary and Martha had a brother who was dead. And in their minds, hope was gone. So today we're looking at the relationship between Mary and Martha and Jesus. Next week, we'll look at the relationship between Jesus and Lazarus. And that's a beautiful one. By the way, can I say this? If you have a loved one that is struggling with drugs, alcohol, addiction, if you have a loved one that's got substance or hang up in their life, next week is valid. It's a very valid week to have them here. We're going to call out Lazarus in the room. Now, I normally don't do that, and I normally don't put it out because I know Satan will fight it, and it'll be the hardest message we ever get to develop, hardest message we ever have to preach. But I'm going to tell you this now. It's time that we look at the world that we live in and stop seeing it as hopeless and start seeing it as, hey, there is a Jesus that can help us, and there is a Jesus that can change your loved one's heart in a minute. With one breath, with one word, everything in them can totally change. So let's look at Mary and Martha. We don't find them very happy, do we? If you, if you go to verse number 18, or 17 is what I was going to read. We need Christians like this. Um, it, it, it said, uh, it, when, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had been in his grave for how many days? All right, look at verse 16. This is where Thomas said, we're going with him. Let's go die with Jesus. Hey, you know why? Because Jesus had been threatened to be stoned in the city he was walking into. They were begging him not to go. Jesus said, we talked about it last week. If we're going to go into the devil's territory, we better be ready to face hell. And if we're going to go after addicts, if we're going to be a church that feeds the hungry, if we're going to be a church that clothes people, if we're going to be a church that uses our resource to get the gospel out there, then you watch out because Satan's coming. But I'd rather die for Jesus than to live for the world. Anybody else like that? Because to die is to live. Isn't that cool? Write it down. Anytime you die with Christ, you find life. Anytime. If you die to your flesh, you find life in your spirit. If you die in the body and it's dead and it's over, you find everlasting life around the throne of God. You cannot die with Jesus. You only find new life. Every time a part of you goes, he comes in and gives you something new. You cannot lose. Would you really say this? I cannot lose. Say it. I oh, declare it. In Jesus, I cannot lose. Oh, man, we need that, right? 
So let them, let them bring the diagnosis. Let the sickness come. Let it, let it wreck and rain all around you. And when you think life can't get any worse, just know that when you get to heaven, it can't get any better. All right. So just keep going. When he gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Some of your hopes and dreams have been dead for decades. Some of your hopes and dreams went out the door when your ex-husband walked out and left you. Some of your hopes and dreams left when the church fell apart. Some of your hopes and dreams left when, when your children stopped calling you as much as they used to. Some of your hopes and dreams fell apart when the, the kids you raised, the kids you took to church, the kids you put God in front of is now saying they don't believe. It fell apart when they chose a different gender. It fell apart when they chose a different lifestyle. It fell apart when they chose something opposite of what you had trained them to be. Some of you are sitting in here today and your hearts are broken and you've been thinking there's no hope because your loved one is already dead. There's no coming back. You know how many people I've heard say people can't change? I'll be honest with you. We're powerless to change on our own. Anybody say amen to that? If you've been in recovery, that's step one. All right? Hey, we're powerless to change anything on our own. That's why I'm thankful I have a powerful Savior who can change anyone. That's right. And so today, when he shows up at this four day late, four days in the grave, Mary and Martha come like many of us come. It says Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I was reading this the other day, and I, and I want to put a challenge out to believers. All right. Right now, we haven't had healthy children in, in months, right? You know what I love? Our elders showed up in belief that God could heal. I, I don't want consolers in my life when I want to mope. Does that make sense? I don't need somebody, neither do you. I'm going to speak on my behalf because I can only speak on me. I don't need somebody to come around and put their arm around me and say, oh, I'm so sorry. Now, I do need empathy and sympathy. Don't get me wrong. I'm human, all right? I'm crying now and don't even know why, all right? That's just, it, it, this is so passionate in my heart, I guess. I don't want somebody to come up and start talking about how bad life is and I don't understand this. I need a believer to show up. And, and I, I read this and I thought to myself, the church showed up to Mary and Martha having a message from Jesus Christ that said, your brother won't be dead. And they didn't show up saying, hey, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He's going to live. They showed up just saying, oh, poor pitiful you. Now I'm talking to people today that have loved ones and other people that are in addiction. I'm talking straight to you. Stop enabling their bad behavior. Stop coddling bad lifestyle. Stop, as a church, just being okay with people who are living mediocre. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I'd much rather you live right than to raise a hand and worship. You know, I, I saw somebody once post about grace, and you do clap, and you do raise your hands, and you do praise, and sometimes you'll get loud, and they ring cowbells and all that other stuff in here, and some, of, some people might freak out and say it's too loud. I get that. While other people are saying, I want to go to a church where I can raise my hand, and I, I, I wanted to comment on their post, and I didn't, so I'll do it publicly now two years later. Ready? You ready? If you want to go to a place where they're actually raising their hand and worshiping God, stop sleeping with your boyfriend. You know, stop, stop living a lifestyle outside of that and then judging the church because you're not feeling the presence of God. It ain't because the person behind you didn't raise their hand. It's because you're living a lifestyle that God said no to. Are you with me? You say, that's too harsh. I know we're in a world where everybody gets offended, but I'll tell you this right now. I would rather you be offended and change your life than for you to live in the state that you're in, never having experienced God's life for you. All right. Is God against sex? Can we just throw this out here? Somebody talk to me. Is God against sex? All right, can I be very, very vivid for a second? All right, he created it. He created body parts, especially on women, that the only purpose those body parts have is sexual pleasure. God designed it that way. He designed it to be safe. He designed it to take care of you. He designed it for it to be a fulfilling part of your life. He designed it to be a great thing. It's just been so misused in our world. Hey, anybody else in here abused your sexual life? I'll raise my hand. Anybody else in here abused it? All right. And, and how many of you regret it? Would you slip your hand up in the air? Right, how many of you would take it back if you could? Right. I tell our teenage girls all the time, any boy in the world can have sex with you, but a boy that wants to really love you is going to learn you. And not everybody's willing to have that type of intention span. So make sure that there's a boy that loves God because a boy that loves God will love you. A girl that loves God will love you. But they won't love the physical aspect of you. They'll love the true aspect of who you are. All right? Y'all get very quiet on that. You, you say, why do you pick on sexual sin? Uh, number one, I've lived it and I know the effects. It's terrible. Somebody back me up. I ain't the only one in the room done it. Hey, hey it's terrible. The damage it leaves behind is terrible. You know what Paul said? No other sin affects your body like a sexual sin. 
You know why I believe the church is asleep today? God, this isn't in my notes. Let's go. You know why I believe it's asleep today? It's because we are coddling sexual behavior. And we can't do it. And there's Jezebel spirits that are running all around us. Seducing and enticing, and, and, and their, their intention is to destroy you, destroy your home, destroy the church, and destroy everything. Grace almost lost who it was because of it. You know, and I'm going to be honest with you. There's a God that can free and kill Jezebel. You need to go read that story. There's a God that can behead that. I think we need to call it out. I don't mean to offend you. Some of you may leave the church because we're talking about a sin that nobody wants to talk about in church anymore. But I will say this. I would rather be honest with you and tell you that if you want true freedom, if you want somebody who loves you, if you're tired of boys that use you and leave, then stop sleeping with them. And they'll leave before you get your heart broke. The ones that are in it for the wrong thing will drop you. How many of you ladies can testify to that? Yeah. But the ones that truly desire you will chase you. They'll, they'll pursue the God in you. And, 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 and I'll promise you that as, as they're pursuing God through you, you'll find a protector. You'll find a provider. You'll find somebody that loves the Lord. Matter of fact, God set up the perfect image of a man you should marry. Right? He, he, he put up Adam in a garden in the spot of God it, it, with the message of God, walking in the will of God that had a job. And he said, that man shouldn't be alone. Have, y'all have heard this before. I'm going to say it again. You know, stop messing around with deadbeats and expecting life to come. Now, I don't care what you say. That's good preaching. All right. It's not popular. It's not Facebook worthy. Our algorithm is way down. We went from like 1,400 views a week to like 300 a week. And not because we changed anything and people want to say it's this. And then I look at First Baptist and they're doing the same thing. You know why? Because Facebook is burying the gospel. You know, and I'll be honest with you, that's why the church shouldn't rely on it. Use it as a tool. That's not how we should be getting the gospel out. You know, the best way to get your gospel out is your voice on their ears, your eyes on their bodies, your presence in their presence. Love them, love them, love them, love them. Why? Because you cannot fail and neither can they if Jesus shows up. Four days dead, who cares? Four years this way, who cares? Your marriage has been dead for 25 years, who cares? All that we need to know is this. You've been dead too long and now there's a savior raising right, the dead standing right next to you. He He's here today calling you out saying, hey, addiction no more, affliction no more, no more victim lifestyle. Church, wake up and let's believe that you can walk out of this today. We can't coddle it. We can't condone it. And they were consoling her. And when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. That's an angry woman right there. Are you with me? You know what the Bible says about angry women, right? Get on the roof. Some of us have a different version and jump, right? Like what the thing is, is he says, get up there. It's better to be on the roof. Yeah, you say, yes, those angry women. You know what God tells us, by the way, men, is we shouldn't make them mad. I'm just putting that out there. But I am so off track. <laughs> but I, I, I think sometimes the Holy Spirit says we need to lay some things out. But Mary stayed in the house. That's an angry woman, too. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, I love this though. That's a key word. I don't care how mad you are at life right now. Keep calling him Lord. Keep letting him lead. I don't care how broken you are today. I do care. I don't mean it to sound that way. I don't know where you are today. I don't know how far gone you are today. I don't know how bitter your heart is today. Just keep him Lord. Just keep him Lord. I promise you he will deal with this. Yeah. Lord, if you had only been here. My brother wouldn't have died. That's faith. That's a belief that if you were present, it wouldn't have happened. What she didn't have faith to believe is that he didn't have to be present to be God. That no matter where he is and no matter what he's doing, he's still God. And even if it's dark today, he's still the light. And even if there's shadows in your life and you don't understand, there's still the sun shining, sitting on the right hand of God. I can't find words to pray. Great. There's a son praying for you. Hey, I don't know where to go. Great. There's a word that will lead you. His words will direct your steps. He will guide you. You may feel abandoned. You may feel your prayers are unheard. You may feel like you've poured out everything you've got to God and he hasn't shown up. It's not a matter of if God will show up. It's a matter of when. He is coming. He will do what he says he will do. You will see deliverance. You will see victory. It may not be in your timing, but he's still God, even if he's late on your schedule. If you'd only been here, 
I like verse 22. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. That's calling him out. I wrote this down, write it in your notes. Let's look at Martha and Mary real quick. They're hurting because of their loss. I know some of you in here have lost loved ones to COVID. Some of you in here have lost loved ones um, that were young, children, um, miscarriages. Um, we can go down the list. Cancer. Um, we've seen suicide. Overdose. You name it. I feel like in the past 11 years, we've experienced it in a multiple scale. As I look around the room, I know that that hits you. Some of you are sad because truly today, your loss is somebody laying in a grave. But you know that grave that the devil, I firmly believe, designed to hold them is powerless to the keys that Jesus holds today. And the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be what? I'm a firm believer that there is no such thing as purgatory. There is no such thing as a holding tank. Your loved one's not just laying in the ground. All right, I'll be honest with you right now. I believe that the moment they left this world, they entered his. And I believe it's an eyes closed and a breath taken here. And the next inhale is right in the atmosphere of heaven. And I am thankful today that they are in a place where if they know Jesus Christ and they have him as savior to where they will never experience the hurt that took them to the deathbed that's breaking your heart today. But we've got to believe today that to be dead here is alive there. Number two, they're blaming others. If you'd only been here. Anybody else ever prayed like that? Maybe not those words. But anybody else ever said, you're God, why not? Why not me? Why not now? You hear somebody's testimony and you should be able to celebrate what God's done in their lives. You're the, you're the wife of a drug addict, a husband of a drug addict, and, and they're standing here saying how their spouse got delivered and you've been praying every night, fasting every time you get a chance. You've been hitting your knees, asking God, begging him to bail out your boy, bail out your girl, free them from jail, free them from bondage, get them away from their family and friends. And while somebody's standing with a testimony of victory, you're sitting with a heart that's broken. I know it's true and I know it's real. Matter of fact, I'll promise you this, our hearts break with you, not in the way that you do because we're not you. We're not married. We're not as committed as you are. We haven't lived with it every day of our lives, but we grieve what's going on in people's lives. And as we look around, I know to, to be true that some of you here, if we were to give a testimony of God's healing, would start immediately hearing your enemy, immediately hearing a demon, immediately hearing Satan say, well, your faith must not have been good enough. That's why your husband died and her husband's healed. And that is not true. Sin is a result of what? Adam and Eve. And sin brings the result of what? Say it. Death. And you're sitting here and you're saying, well, it's because they were a sinner they died. No, it's because we're in a flawed world. Let's explain it one more time. By the way, some of you that say you tell us these things month after month, you're not the only person in the room. Every week there's new people tuning in online. Every month there's a new email of somebody that says, you had no idea, but God spoke this and did this. We hear them a lot. So understand this, that your spouse may have died, your child may have died, not because of their direct sin, but because they're in a world that is plagued by sin and sin results in death. Matter of fact, our sins killed Jesus. The beauty of it is Jesus made a statement when he walked out three days later that your sin in that death of sin cannot control him. And he stepped up and he said, you can live after death, right? Some of you are in here and you'll start blaming yourself. How many of you blame yourself for the action of others? DJ sent me a book on YouTube. It's an older book, I'd say. I've listened to every part I could find on, on YouTube on codependency, um, which by the way, is a, is a behavior of someone who normally is either in addiction or around by addiction or has hurt in their lives. Um, as I read that book, I'm like, or listened to it, I was like, I wonder if he sent this to me because I have this problem. Um, it talks about how they're constantly trying to fix people. He didn't. He has that problem because he's moody. All right, so here it is. No, but as I said, a, vic a conviction set in. I literally, yesterday while I was driving, I had a three and a half hour round trip drive. I listened to each segment twice. Um, just simply because of how it resonated. It, it, it started talking about how we get in these behaviors to where we want to fix everybody. I don't know about you, but you know, I, I used to think that that was a good thing. 
I want to help the world. Anybody on here want to help the world too? How many of you found that it is heartbreaking to try to help the world? You know why? Because the world doesn't want to help themselves. And they will put all the burden on you. And I I don't know about you, but I want my prayers to heal my son. I, I lay my hand on his head every single night and I want it to heal my son. And it hasn't happened yet. But what we can't deny is that there's been great progress. And if we're not careful, we'll want total healing instead of celebrating the work that God is doing in his life. Are you following this? And sometimes we want immediate freedom. We want immediate restoration. I have sat with loved ones of people that lost loved ones that died and went into eternity that literally wished that they could die to go be with them. Some of you are in this room. And you sit there and you say, hey, if I could have just believed more, if I could have just done more, if I could have just been more, if I could have lived right more, maybe things would be different. Stop buying the lie of Satan. That's a codependent mindset. It is not you. It's not your fault. You're not the reason they cheated. You're not the reason they lived. But if I stop it, it's a lie. It's a world that's messed up. It's a choice that they made. It's a sin that resulted in the death of the human race. There is no healing where blaming is found. Please put that in your notes. Adam and Eve, when they were hidden. And by the way, if you've got somebody that's in this lifestyle, know this, that as long as they're hiding that lifestyle, they're not standing in a place of, of repentance. Um. It's the moment they left the bush and came and stood before God. That's when they could get clothed. All right. Those of you that are here that the enemies lie to you saying this is, you know, you're doing what you're doing because of your daddy. I've had daddy issues too, but my choices took me to where I went. All right. You're doing what you're doing because they didn't. No, 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 no. Listen, you are responsible for you. You can't control everybody else, but you can control you. I don't want to get too deep into this because we're going to talk to Lazarus next week. But the truth is this, a lot of times we'll sit there and we'll start thinking, well, if, if, if I would have, they would have, this would have, they, my church didn't, they didn't, the, the elders didn't call me, nobody noticed that I missed church for a month, nobody noticed that this, that, and the other, and they're the reason why. No, 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 stop it, stop blaming. Yeah. And if you're the one sitting here today with someone that's hurting, or you sit here today with a hurt cause of a lot, stop blaming. If you want healing in your life, Adam and Eve came out of hiding, and then the next thing they did was blamed each other. Adam blamed who? If you've been here for a while, you know. Eve and God, the woman you gave me. All right, let's let's play that role again. I was perfect in the, uh, you know, I I was in the garden. I was this, I was all that. We talked, we were bros, we hung out, and then you made her. I mean, that's Adam, right? You made her. Now, we forget about the verse where it says when Eve ate of the fruit, Adam was there with her. Uh, Part of being a man and and part of being a spiritual leader in your home, guys, listen to me, is speaking up and saying the things of God when the enemy's after your family. It's being the leader. Hey, Satan is after his wife and he stands there and lets it happen. And then because he loved her more than anything else in that moment, he ate with her. And yet when it came time to stand responsible, whose fault was it? Hers and God's. It was like you, me shoving a cookie out and saying, here, take this. And you eating 10 of them, going home with a belly ache and, and then putting on your Facebook or your Twitter that you have a tummy ache because of your pastor. No, I didn't shove it down your throat. Your own five fingers did. Am I right? right. We got to get to a place in our lives that we stop looking around and saying, it's because of all this that I am the way I am. No, you are the way you are because you're stuck. You're stuck in a mindset of hurt. You are where you are today because... Grief is real. And, and, and understand this. For some reason in religion and in churches, we've made grief a bad thing. When actually it is God's way of healing us. Hey, write it in your notes. Please get it. Even God grieves. Even God hurts. Even Jesus had anxiety and stress and loneliness and depression. Even Jesus had a moment where his body was so to the edge that he broke down in sweat of blood. A physical condition, the closest to death you can get from a stress-induced thing without actually dying. And we look at it and we're like, oh, it's because he cared. It's because he was human. He was human. 
Yes, the son of God, perfect in every way, but in a body. Write it and understand it. Your body can only take so much. Would you agree? How many of you would be like, my mind can only take so much? You ever get to that point where you're like, I can't do this anymore. If I get one more phone call today, or if one more person says a mean thing to me, or if one more kid throws up, or if one more poop, you diaper. Come on, I, last night we were playing a game with a group of friends, and one of the questions was, what is one thing that every mom with young kids wishes for? And it was like a nap, peace and quiet, a spa day, all right? Some of you women are like ready to testify. The truth is this. God knows that you cannot handle everything. When he showed up, Mary and Martha were trying to figure it all out. Like, wait a minute. Anybody else like this? Anybody else read the Bible and actually believe it? Talk to me. But then yet, you've read it and you believed it, and you've applied it, and you've lived by it, and yet its promise isn't happening in your life yet. And then you start wondering, is this real? I'm not the only one in the room, am I? Then you start thinking, is all this a lie? Now, by the way, the only reason you're thinking that is evidence of an enemy. Because if it wasn't real, he'd let you believe it and never challenge it. AKA, also known as evolution. Are you with me? You know how hard of a time we have with our teenagers convincing them that God is the creator, evolution's not real? You know why? Because Satan's not attacking in their minds the theory of evolution. He's attacking the existence of God. Why? He only attacks what he's threatened by. The fact that you have doubt is proof that there's an enemy, and there can't be an enemy without proof of a risen Savior and a Lord. Amen. Are you with me? Isn't that cool? Start reversing that psychology on him. That dude's an idiot. But understand this. I've sat there and I've read, and the promise has been delayed, and then all of a sudden you start thinking, I'm not doing this right. Or you go to some churches and they say, well, if you believe more. I don't know how much more I can believe. You ever been there? They're saying, you sent a message with your disciples. If you don't know the story, the beginning of the chapter. They sent at the very beginning word to Jesus, your friend, the one you love is dying. And Jesus, you replied. You sent a text that said, your brother will not die. And now he's dead. You talk about shaking a faith. Please write this down. What's over to you isn't over to God. What's over you isn't over God. What you can't get over, God has already gotten over. And you may be sitting there thinking, you told me your word said, if two touch anything asking in my name, it shall be done. And we prayed. I shared, when we were trying to buy our first house, we'd lay hands, me and Jordan, we would lay hands on the houses we loved and we'd pray on the front door. And, we, and, and, and in my mind, I believe by doing so that God would let that house deal go through. And every time we did it, the house sold to somebody else. And this was before the COVID market and all this other stuff. And, 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 and literally the thought was, I'm gonna stop praying. Because every time I pray, it goes another way. And the truth is, if you're praying and it's going another way, write it down, keep Mark. If God keeps doing it different than you're praying, then know that God's best is on its way. That God has something better than you plan. The house we lived in now, um, uh, we, we went, we looked at, and Jordan was about to start her first job, and they would not allow us to apply for a loan until our first day of work. And we were like four days away from her first day of work. So the real estate agent said, we can't write the contract because you couldn't. It's fraudulent. You've got to be fully applied for your loan within three days. And so we, we, we were so excited. That house had set on the market for almost seven months. You know, and, 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 and this is going to be the one. And we loved it and everything was in it. And, 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 and all of a sudden, the day before she works her first day, somebody else gets a house. And then we go and we keep looking. We find a house and... All of a sudden, we start outgrowing that house, and Lincoln comes along, and 
in-laws and, and everybody that's staying with us, we realize that we, we need an extra bedroom. And, and so we start praying. And guess what? We found a house right over here next to the church. It was perfect. We went over and we looked at it. We prayed over it, did the same thing. And wouldn't you know it, that booger sold too. And we went to Illinois so depressed. And I remember being in Illinois thinking, we're never going to find a home. I was over it, sick of it, tired of looking for it. And then all of a sudden, I sell the home that we originally loved back on the market. And, and as I looked at it, I was like, Jordan, this is the house. This is the house that we prayed over years ago and we did not get. And I called a realtor, we got to see this house. But as I flipped through the pictures, I realized that there was something different. When we looked at the house, the crawl space was as tall as underneath our balcony and it was just open all the way through. And I'm like, I don't know why they didn't put a room down here. I'm going to build a man cave. That's what I thought. All my Alabama gear go everywhere. Joe come over all excited in his crimson and white. <laughs> but I do not have a construction background. And my goal was there was an outdoor entrance. And so I was just going to build a room connected to the outdoor entrance. You had to go outside to get to it. Really smart, right? But the person that bought the house from us went and decided and saw and brought an architect in that they could put a staircase from the inside down and they built out an entire basement that would house our in-laws. And, 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 and as we went back and bought it, we bought the house cheaper than we could have done the renovation ourselves and had the space that we were looking for and, and, and God has substantially grown that thing. You say, well, I, I can't get a house. Stop getting mad at somebody else's success. You're succeeding in areas. I would rather have healthy children than a home. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I would rather have a kid that could speak to us and talk to us. And so before you get mad, be thankful you can sit down and have a conversation with your kid. And so as we went back and we bought that home, we bought it cheaper than we could have renovated it for. And then we realized that God didn't let us get it because there was a work he needed to do on it that we couldn't see. And you say, that's crazy. And you know what God showed me is I'm doing the same thing with you. There's things you want. There's things you want to accomplish. There's marriages you want. There's things you want in your life right now. And you want it right now, but God's got to do a work because if you get it right now, you're going to mess it up. You're going to do something stupid like have an outside entrance into a heated and cold room and it's not going to work out where God can do it better. You're thinking right now, if you're in a recovery, hey, second chance guys and everybody else that's around here, you're thinking if you had your own place, that life would be better. But God knows if you got your own place, your drug dealer would show up that night. God knows if you got your own place, there would be a Jezebel spirit show up and try to lure you in and try to get you into something. And so God's got you in a place that's uncomfortable. You might be sharing a room with somebody you can't stand. You might be in a job that you wish you didn't have, but God's preparing you for what he's going to do. And when God finishes the work, I guarantee you, if you let God do the work, it won't cost you as much, but it'll open up opportunities for you. Stop blaming God and others for the things that are happening in your life. Start trusting that God's doing something. Look at number three. Not only were they there, they were angry. Number four, they were scared. Now, let me ask you this, and, and I want you to write it in your notes. Matter of fact, close your eyes real quick. How many of you in the room are hurting, mad, scared, confused? How many of you in the room wish that somebody else would shape up? Raise your hand in any of those areas. How many of you in the room have those emotions going through your life? Hurting, mad, scared, blaming somebody else for your lacks, blaming somebody else for your pain, blaming any of those. Raise them, raise them high. Hold them high. Hold them high. Hold them high. That is all, that's most of our church. Take it down. If I were to put a percentage on that just for you online and just for you here, open your eyes. If I were to put a percentage on that, that was over 90% of the ones in the auditorium. And it's not an empty auditorium today. It's a pretty full auditorium today. 90% of those present, no telling how many sitting at home. You know what I'd say? You're Mary and Martha. You care. Matter of fact, write this down. It doesn't hurt if you don't care. I've had a mom cry out to me in a class one time and say, how long is too long before I should give up on my children ever coming to Christ? And we said, never give up. They're breaking my heart. Never stop. You're hurting because you care. Do you believe today there's hope for the addict? Yeah. Some of you are living proof that addicts can change. We live in a world that says, once a cheater, always a cheater. Once a thief, always a thief. Once a liar, and God says that is not true. Once a lie, now living. Once a cheater, now loyal. Once a sinner lost, now a son and daughter of God. Once dead, now alive in heaven. Hey, there are many Mary and Marthas in the room today that care deeply. 
But don't become codependent and think that God has called you to fix the world. Don't become so dependent on yourself that you think it's your faith, that you're the only one that can activate heaven. That's why I hate it when churches say, come, experience the Holy Spirit here. I want to be a church that says, experience him in your car. Experience him in your house. When you go to bed tonight, cuddle him. Let him know he's there. Let yourself know. Hey, if you're scared, know that there are angels guarding you. Know that God has given power over you. Don't come to church to get the Spirit. Go in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Grow in the Spirit. You are children of God. This isn't the only place God shows up. Oh, man, God is so good. He's everywhere. He's just a few miles away in Bethany, but no, he knows your need. He's just a little bit outside of where you are, but no, he sees what you're going through. And know this. God loves your loved one more than that you ever could. I heard my wife pray that over my kids. God, I know you'd love Lincoln more than I ever could. And I thought to myself, ooh, I've never thought about that. I've always thought, maybe it's a man thing. Women, you tell me if I'm wrong. I always thought, I gotta be strong. I gotta be the leader. I gotta show them that God answers my prayers. I gotta convince them. Remember, when we first got married, I used to come home to Jordan and brag about everything I had done that day for the Lord. You know, it's almost like when your husband did the dishes and has to let you know about it. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? I'd come home and I'd, you know, I did this. And you know what? I literally thought in my mind that the more I did for God, the more I would impress her. Um, and I remember very vividly sitting um, on the couch one day in a parsonage and I told her everything I did. And, and, and she said something to the effect, very real and very true. She said, I wish you could give some to me that you're willing to give to everybody else. And in there, I got mad. I really got mad at that statement. Now, it wasn't me bad. It's a very biblical statement. But my thought is, here I am trying to impress you, and that's what you see. Can I tell you this right now? I firmly believe that some of your marriages are under such a delusional attack that you believe that everything your spouse is saying is to harm you and that they hate you and that they're against you. But I firmly believe that if we could remove the blinders of what Satan's put, the bitterness and anger that Satan's put into our homes away, we would realize that if they were against you, they would have already been out the door. Are you following this? That they're for you. I've talked to some of your husbands and I've talked to some of your wives and I've heard their hearts pour out for you in ways that you never could know. And then I get bound by confidentiality and I'm not allowed to tell you. Right? And you know what my prayer immediately becomes? God, help them to see this. Even this week, I've been praying that over my own family. You know, because if I'm not careful, I feel like I have to be impressive to change people's lives. Anybody else feel like that sometimes? How many of you can understand when we say you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders? Anybody feel like that today? Raise your hand. Come on, make a public testimony of that. Wow, yeah. If you were strong enough to carry the weight of the world, you would have been strong enough to carry the cross, and God knew you couldn't do that. That's why he sent his son, because the cross would have crushed us, not because the wood was heavy, but the burden of sin was too great for us to carry. And if you could not die for their sins, then why are you killing yourself right now trying to get them free? There's only one person that can come to that grave. There's only one name that can break a bond of hell. There's only one name that can break a generational curse. There's only one name that can set people free. Anybody want to take a stab at that name? Jesus. And today, we have got to get to a place that, hey, you care. Mary, Martha, listen to me. I know you care, but stop feeling like it is up to you. Because it's not. When it comes to helping others, I'm going to give you three things and we'll be out. Ready? Here's three things you got to remember. Number one, you got to stop fixing everyone and everything. And start growing your faith. Do you know what I like? In one moment she says, if you would have only been here, he wouldn't have died. Now a faith step. But you're here now. And I know 
that God will give you anything you ask for. Hey, I wish it would have been different. But I still believe that there is hope because you're still here now. I would have done it a different way. Anybody say that about your life? When it comes to how God's moving and working? But you're still God. We've got it. too many people trapped here. This is the wake up call again. Stop getting trapped of it should have been, could have been, would have been, if it had been, and what if. I, 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 I don't understand in my life sometimes why God does the things the way he does them. And Job spent 37 chapters asking God, why? Why did you do this? And then all of a sudden, chapter 39, God started speaking. Where were you when I formed the world? Where were you when I told the, the, the waves, this is how far you could go? Where were you when I set the boundaries of the universe? Where were you when I did this? Do you feed the sheep? Do you see where the lamb gives birth? Do you know where the sharks reproduce? Do you know these things, Job? No. Who is this who questions my wisdom? And who is this who questions my authority? He does that for three chapters. And then Job does what I'm calling Mary and Martha's to do today. He does what we need. He gets to a point where he says, oh, wow, you're speaking of things that I did not even understand. I take back everything I said. You are God and I will trust you. We need some people that, yes, we want it to happen our way, but we're going to believe that God can do it and will do it in a way that no one else could ever deny. Today, if you were able to set people free, if, 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 if every person that stood before me, we laid hands on and did James 5 and every person was healed and every person had their demons cast out and everything happened, I firmly believe that people would go out in the community and start advertising, come to a church where people are getting healed instead of going out and saying, Jesus did a work today. You know, are you with me? You say, no, I would praise him. Really? Really? Then give me five good things that God did for you yesterday. Go. Three. See what I'm saying? We don't even know all the things that God did for us yesterday. We don't even know all the works that God did for us. But how many of you believe God did a work in your life yesterday? Kept you safe from a deer that ran straight into the side of your car. Kept you safe... Hey, it sold the house that you've been praying and praying and praying and set you free of a lot of burden in your life. Am I right? Hey, what about the people in here that were at the edge of divorce that are still married years and years beyond it? Let's get a shout from you today. All right. Yeah. What about the people who here that, that were once the kids that were living in cars and living in homes where drugs was more important and living in a place absent of love. But now you're sitting in a place that you can't stand because people won't keep their hands off of you. They want to hug you and tell you how much they love you all the time. I'll never forget Bree saying, this place creeps me out. <laughs> he was like, why? Here's a little girl who, who they, they witnessed murder. They, they saw things that they never should have seen. Battle autism. They live in their car for years. They're without for years. And then all of a sudden they step into a place with two weird people named Howard and Sandy that all they want to do is love them so much that they adopt them and then bring them to another place where everybody's high-fiving and hugging all the time and we're giving cooties and COVID everywhere because we just love people. And all of a sudden she looks at me and she says, y'all are all lovey-dovey. And then six months later, takes a necklace off and hands it to me. And for the first time out of her mouth, I heard the words, I love you. I showed her just the other week. That was years ago, three or four. I said, you know, that still sits on my shelf in my office. And I still see that because it's proof to me that the unloved lives can totally change when they get one glimpse, one experience, and one encounter of God's love. Now the girl wants to sing and, and write and you get her talking and she won't shut up. And <laughs> It's a whole different woman, isn't it? And we don't see a little scared girl anymore. We see a warrior. We see a fighter. We see somebody that has Yahweh in their lives. And what we're saying to this is just, hey, listen, you know, I, I, I'll say it. Richard and Marilyn, y'all are the biggest inspirations. Y'all lost your little boy, and yet you show up for Bible school. You, you show up to help kids. You're donating his stuff to people that are in need, and they pour out, and through their grief, and yes, that grief is still real in their life, they have ministered to others because Satan said, I'm going to rip your heart out, and they put their hearts in God's hands instead of trying to fix it themselves. Now, are, they, are you where you want to be? No. 
but I am super proud of where you are. And I think you need to hear that. And I know they hate being called out in front of people, but we're going to do it anyway. Can I tell you, I could go story after story, 100 after 100 people who, who literally have, have been to the edge of nothing. Anybody in here say, I too have been at rock bottom? Raise your hand. How many of you have been there? How many of you said, and we say it all the time here, how many of you found that even at the bottom, the rock is still Jesus? Anybody else saying that too? Hey, listen, I want you to understand this. God will let you get to the end of yourself so that he can do something that will make you a believer. That's what he told his disciples. I'm going to make you believers. You will know. If he goes to a bed of a sick man, it could be coincidence, right? You know, it's coincidence that you left five minutes late and you avoided the head-on collision that would have killed you. That's coincidence. No, that's God's hand in your life. Now, don't tell my wife that being tardy is okay. Because the next thing, she's probably watching right now. And the next time I'm like, Jordan, we got to go, we got to go. She's going to be like, maybe God's delaying us. No, that's you. It's you. I'm just kidding. She's wonderful. As a pastor, one of the most dangerous decisions I ever made, I'm trying to correct this in my life right now, is being always available to every phone call, to every need. You know what I found to be true? Is I would lose sleep over things that the person who called me didn't even lose sleep over. I would be praying for things that the person who called me didn't even pray for. When I had to shut down, I realized that God was still God in my absence. And the worst thing that could ever happen is for a pastor to try to be your God. Because it can't be. Stood by the graveside of your kids too many times. I've been at baby's funerals. I've, I've seen this. I know I can't be your God. I shared with you last week, I, I had to go in the office bathroom and lay on the floor and just weep for minutes before I went into an elder's meeting just because of what our kids are going through. I cannot be your God. I don't understand what's happening in your life, but I do understand this. I know a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And greater love has no man than this, than a man that's willing to lay down his life for his friends. Mary and Martha, listen to me. He may be late, not the way you think. He's still coming. Keep praying. Keep believing. Grow yourself. By the way, write it in your notes. The only person you can change is you. And if you're trying to change everybody else, you're losing you. You're missing out on you. Some of you are sponsors and counselors, and some of you have that desire to be in that. I want to teach you something right now. Um, If they've been living that life 20 years, they will blow your phone up the moment that it reaches its end. And they will want you right then and right now. And if you don't answer, they'll hate you. And you'll get in your mind, you have to answer. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If they've been 20 years getting there, they ain't getting out in one phone call. And if you're with your wife and you're with your kids, you stay with your wife and you stay with your kids. Now, somebody's dying in the hospital, get in the car. We're talking about when when somebody's marriage and they're constantly fighting and they call you every time they're mad, just wanting to, by the way, and I'll say this, most people just want you to say what they want to hear. They don't want to change. But Mary and Martha are standing before God wanting a change. And when they want to change and they stand before God, they can see a change happen. You cannot be the savior of the world, but you can grow your own faith. You can grow your own heart and you can stand true. And will God use you to deliver? And will God set people free through you? Absolutely. But you are not the resurrection and the life. He is. You cannot save the world. He can. But you can be the vessel of which the world sees him. You can smile in the midst of adversity. You can preach with a broken heart. You can teach with things going on in your life. You don't have to be perfect. You just got to point the people to the one who is. Hey, if you would have been here, but you are here now. And you got to understand nowhere in that sentence does she say, why didn't you let me? Because she knew it was impossible with her. Totally possible with him. You cannot fix everyone. Number two, trust God to do a work that you can't do. We can't fix them but he can deliver them. Anybody in here had a mama that prayed for them and yet you kept doing your stupidity? 
Andre, who was it that, that finally got through in your life? A teacher. I remember you telling me that. Third grade, something like that? Seventh grade? Sixth grade. A teacher. How many of you thank God for the people that God puts in the way of your kids to help them, to grow them? Some of you, your parents are thankful that you're sitting right here, right? We should be thankful that God uses other people, right? Because let's be honest, the voice you hear the most, you tune out the most. Amen to that? Parents, how many of you feel like your kids don't hear you? Yeah? They hear you right now. They'd be like, why'd you call me out in front of everybody? Kids, how many of you feel like your parents just don't understand? Not only did he raise his hand, he looked right at his dad. It was like slow motion. He's just like. (laughs) The truth is, is we can't, can we? You can't understand everything that guy goes through. I mean, we're not the same age. We're not the same DNA. We're not the same makeup. We don't even have the same likes. We don't even eat the same foods. I mean, you can be as close to somebody and even have the blood flowing through their veins and not be just like them. If you don't believe that, you can be a child of God and still not look like him. Right? So the truth is this. Sometimes somebody else will come in and say to your kids what you've been saying their whole lives, what you've been praying for, and all of a sudden they hear it. They listen. Don't get bitter and angry when it's not you they're giving in to because it's not you you want in control of their lives. It's not you you want them dependent on. It's the Lord. And so when you're praying, you don't just pray, God, use me. God, use me. Start praying. Hey, God, send the right person. I'm okay with giving credit away. Hey, listen, I'm okay with not being known as the best church in town. I'm okay with not being the biggest. I'm okay with that. As long as we are telling people about Jesus and sending them to heaven, as long as we're seeing people, hey, you got a chance to get right. you got a chance to get clean. I'm okay with being unknown here. Let's make him known while we're here. Because he's the only one that can deliver their lives. He's the only one that can radically change. You, they'll change for somebody else. Matter of fact, I, I'm going to speak to the Lazarus real quick. When, when, when I decided to come clean with my wife on my history of life, I did not do it for her. And I did not change for her. I did it because I wanted to be right with the Lord. And I knew that that was the right thing to do. Did I want to be with her? Did I want to see the marriage restored? Absolutely. But she could not be the motivation. Ladies, men, listen to me. Your husband, your wife, your partner cannot be your motivation in life because they're not strong enough to be God. They're going to have problems of their own. And when they have bad days, what's that do to you? Your sponsor cannot be the God of your life. Your parent cannot be the God of your life. Now, thank God he gave you good parents and thank God he gave you good sponsors and thank God you're in a good church. But understand this, at some point of your life, it's not gonna change until you make God the God, the only true God of your life. That's when change happens. Number three is this. Not only do I have to stop trying to fix everyone and trust God to do a work that only he can do, I got to be obedient to do what he's told me to do. In other words, roll the stone away. You know what I, you know what I got from this? And, and, and you can look at it. Uh, read with me real quick. Um, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet. Verse 32, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, we talk about that in our overcoming grief class. There's a difference between weeping and wailing. This is where it comes from. All right. And it says, when he saw her weeping and wailing, what, what, what happened to Jesus? For all of you think that he was some pansy that was weak and just walked around and sang kumbaya all the time, read the next sentence out loud. A deep, what? Anger welled up within him. Men, if you're anything like me and like most of the men I talk to, you got anger issues. That does not make you a bad person. Jesus had anger issues too. It was in him though. He didn't let it out of him. Be angry and Sin not. Don't let the sun set on your anger. In other words, you're going to be angry. But you don't have to mess people up with it. Said he was deeply troubled. I like this next sentence. This is where I almost preached the whole message on this title. Where have you put him? Now, can I get real with you? We're already in overtime. 
But if you're in our normal time, we're still not in the fourth quarter yet. <laughs> Does that make sense? You got five or ten more minutes? Can, I get, can, wait, can they be real? Can you buckle up? I read that and I wept. And then I realized... Jesus didn't roll the stone away because he didn't roll it up in the first place. Jesus didn't loose him and let him go because he wasn't the one that wrapped him. Jesus had declared him alive. They declared him dead. Was he dead spiritually? No, he was still alive. Was he dead physically? In our eyes, in our logic, yes. So what do you do when somebody messes up? You do what everybody else does. You tell the world about their problems. You make sure everybody knows what they did. You put a label on them and you don't let them go. You bind them by what they did and you declare them dead because of what they did. They can never be used again. They can never do this again. They can never do that, never do this. Stop telling people that they are stuck where they are. And I think today there's a message that needs to ring out and there's a message to the church that's very alive and real. And I'm going to say this, as we look at a world that's broken and dying, as we look at a community that's had 430 overdoses, deaths in in our area, Knox County, surrounding areas, if we look at a place where we're seeing all these things happening, I think the question to the church is, where are we putting them? Where are we taking the hopeless? Where are we taking the broken? Where are we taking the dead? He looks at Mary and Martha and he says, where did you put them? And I'm telling you now, in, in Corinthians, we see where a guy's sleeping with a stepmom. And Jesus said, remove him and through Paul. In the very next book, he says, go pick that person back, lest they be overcome by grief. In Galatians, Paul wrote, if somebody stumbles, help them up. Church, stop labeling them as sinners and start bringing them to the sinless, to the one that can change them. Where are the lost? Where have we labeled them? Have you said your dad is hopeless? Have you said your marriage is hopeless? Have you said that their life is hopeless once they are they always will be stop finding them in clothes that they don't need to be wearing and stop sealing them in tombs where they are are supposed to be kept and start realizing that there's a savior that said that anyone who comes to him he will in no wise no manner no no rejection nothing no way he will cast them out There's room at the cross for a murderer. There's room at the cross for a cheater. There's room at the cross for a liar. There's room at the cross for a molester, an even child molester. There's room at the cross for serial killers. There's room at the cross for, let's get real, for gossips and overeaters. There's room at the cross for victim addicted mindsets where the world's all about me and woe is me and everybody's against me. There's room at the cross for the person that hurt you. There's room at the cross for the people that are getting hurt. There's room at the cross for everybody, for everybody, for everybody. And when Jesus says no one's dead, no one's dead, there's hope for all, then we need to let Jesus be Jesus and stop trying to be Jesus for him. And when anger rose up in him, he looked at them and said, where is he? Keep reading. They told him, Lord, come and see. And there's that small verse 35, and Jesus wept. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved them. But some said, this man healed the blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Keep going with me. Jesus was still angry and arrived at the cave of the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. In verse 39, roll the stone aside. Jesus told him, but Martha said, the dead man's sister, Lord, He's been dead for days. The smell will be terrible. Whew. I wish I had more. I wish I'd have allotted more time for this. God wasn't interested in what the dude smelled like. And God wasn't interested in what the dude looked like. God was interested in doing what he wanted to do in the person's life. And I cry out to the church to stop putting stones and stop putting labels and stop telling God he's too far gone. She's too far gone. There's no such thing with Jesus. But they stink. Do you know what they did? Did you hear what they did? Do you know where they lived? Do you know what they said? Do you know? Hey, blah, blah, blah. It's not a bad, but what you know, it's about what God knows and what God's willing to do with it. Are you with me today? Church, I believe we need to raise a group of believers that when God says, roll the stone away, in other words, take your condemnation off of them, loose them and let them go, means that we need to do certain things. You know how we need to loose them? Number one, you need to forgive them. 
Now, I'm not going to get into it, but forgiveness doesn't mean you forget. Forgiveness just simply means you're not going to hold it over them the rest of their lives. Forgiveness doesn't mean that somebody doesn't have to change. They do need to change their behaviors and their lifestyle. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you belittle your pain. If it hurt, it hurt, and it needs to be dealt with. Forgiveness isn't saying, I'm going to forget. That's impossible, and only God can do it. Forgiveness is simply saying, I'm not going to let this control me for the rest of my life. I'm not going to let this control our marriage. I'm not going to let this control our relationship. I'm not going to let this control our future. That your kid broke curfew six months ago. Maybe it's time to trust them just a little bit and give them another chance. They got to earn those rights. Agreed? They got to prove change of behavior. Agreed? But the truth is this. You're never going to go anywhere further. And they're never going to have a chance to grow if you don't forgive them. Forgiveness is not easy to do, is it? But I'm going to be honest with you. It's necessary. Matter of fact, let's put a bold statement on it. You cannot love someone without forgiving them. Because the people you love are going to let you down. You know why? You're going to get to know them the most. And the people you get to know the most are the people that will disappoint you the most. You know why they disappoint you the most? Because you know them the most. And you sit there, and I, I, I listen to me, you sit there and say the grass is greener on the other side. That grass still has its own problems. And you don't know how much poop they've had to lay down on that yard to get it so clean. You don't know how much they've had to fertilize it. Matter of fact, the healthiest marriages that I know have been through some of the hardest things. And you say, well, I want their marriage. Okay, here's 20 years of struggle. But in this 20 years of struggle, they decided to go to Jesus. So you want it? Fertilize it. Yeah, it means this. There's no giving up. There's no bailing out. I, I, I'm tired, and, and I get this all the time. I know the statistics of recovery are not good. I love DJ's response when he was asked in that business meeting, what's the success rate? He did not give a percentage because success is not measured by the percentage. It's measured by the progress. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If somebody today came to church and it's first time they've been to church in a long, long time, that's success. If somebody today said, I'm going to not give up on you and I'm going to keep going when yesterday they wanted to quit, that's success. It's not that they're clean and that they don't have tracks on their arms. It's not that they're clean and that they've cleaned up their whole lifestyle. It's that today they made a decision to change. One of my favorite statements to hear, Mary and Martha, listen to me, start listening for this statement. I've never told anybody this. I'm going to tell you something that nobody knows. I'm going to let a skeleton out that nobody's ever seen. I can't carry this anymore. I can't bear this anymore. Will you listen to me? Listen, open your ears because the revealing of feeling is the beginning of healing. Every single time when somebody is willing to do what they've never been done before, when they're willing to trust Jesus just a little bit more than they did yesterday, that is success. Hey, the first thing that brought success to Lazarus was not the fact that he walked out of the tomb is that the fact that he heard the voice of Jesus and was able to stand up. Lazarus, come forth. He stands. He still can't walk. He still can't see. You know why he still can't walk and he still can't see? He's still bound by the things that Mary and Martha put on him. I'm telling you this right now. There are people that God is calling to freedom that can't see God because the church has too much shame put on them. Are you with me? How many of you have been there? How many of you have been totally shamed by somebody you love? Slip your hand up in the air. How many of you could not get up because of the own guilt you had in your heart? Anybody like that? I'm telling you this right now. We should not condone and console bad behavior. But we should definitely celebrate when a prodigal comes home. We should definitely be excited when somebody is willing to change. You know how many times I've seen somebody hit an altar that I've prayed for for years, and then all of a sudden somebody will say, oh, they just did that because get your rap off of them. Roll your stone away from them. You know what? Some of you are the Lazarus, and your prayer needs to be, hey, God, don't let their stones dictate the rock I stand on. Can I tell you this? There are two rocks that you'll build your life on, the opinions of others, or Jesus Christ. Don't build on the wrong rock. Anybody else ever built on the opinions of others? How'd that work out? How many of you gave years of your life to somebody who now won't even talk to you? And you're sitting there and you're saying, what's wrong with me? Hey, not always is the problem you. The problem is the God you're choosing to worship. Is this too deep? Is this real? It's, it, it, it's so common. You know why we can't get sinners to go to the church? Because the church will throw them in the graveyard. 
and Jesus doesn't make tombs. Roll that stone away. And to every person afflicted, broken, bound by depression and hurting in here, I declare in Jesus' name, roll that stone away. To every person who has hatred and bitterness in their heart, I declare in Jesus' name, roll that stone away. To every person who's called to be kind to someone who's been mean to them, roll that stone away. If we're going to be Mary and Martha, we got to be kind. Loose them and let them go. So many of you God used in such a radical way in my life over the last three years. When I talk about this publicly, I get ridiculed, but I feel like the testimony of God needs to happen. There were so many that wanted me to, to go to hell. He's not saved. He can't be saved. There's no way you can be saved and blah, blah, blah. Yet they'll quote Paul and they'll quote Peter. They'll say they love and they say they forgive while telling you you can never be used by God again. I had two men in a Cracker Barrel sit me down and look me in the face and say, you should have never taken a pulpit. Both of those men I had gone to and both of them had encouraged me to let God do with the healing that he wanted to do at Grace. But when God's healing at Grace looked different than their opinion of what healing should be, they immediately met it with, you need to resign our board. Because what would people think? And then they did that for 10 minutes while I wept out loud in the middle of a Cracker Barrel. They sat and they started saying, what would so-and-so think if they found out between themselves? What would so-and-so say if we told them? This was two and a half years after I had stood in confession. I, I, and I said to them, they already know. There's no way they've watched our sermons and not known. Matter of fact, I've been so open with my testimony that many of my advisors have told me to stop talking about the things that we went through. But the truth is this. If I stop talking about what God has brought us out of, how will other people get hope? And I start thinking to myself, some of you men in here right now are so conflicted with pornography and the thought of cheating that I feel like you need to hear the testimony of what that would do to you. It will destroy you. The guilt and the shame would be so overwhelming. But beyond that, what you will do to your wife is way more than your heart can bear. The brokenness she would experience, the shattering, the image destroyed and Satan telling her how ugly she is. And you will have to live with that. There's a God that can heal those things. There's a God willing to forgive you of what you've done. A God willing to clean you up. A God willing to say, Lazarus, Josh Moore, you fill in your name. He's standing at your tomb that you've been buried in and he's calling you out and he's giving you a chance to walk out. And by you walking out, there will be believers made. There will be hope reborn. Mary and Martha did not leave the tomb the way they came. Lazarus did not leave the tomb the way they came. The disciples did not leave the tomb the way they came. They left with hope. They left with a belief that there was a Savior that can raise the dead. And I believe that in our world and in the middle of Jeff County, there needs to be a church that believes that God can resurrect our marriages, resurrect our genders, resurrect our lives, resurrect our hopes, resurrect our dreams, resurrect our children, resurrect the addict, resurrect the broken, resurrect the orphan, resurrect the foster, resurrect the person who's broken today. He's got healing for the anxiety. He's got healing for the depression. He can take you out of the pit that you're in. There is a God standing at your tomb declaring your freedom. And the church needs to be standing there ready to set them loose, set them free, and let it be known. Just a few chapters later, they're standing there and they're saying, Lazarus, the man that used to be dead, is now standing with Jesus. We need people that are not ashamed of what God's done in their lives. That will not forget what God's done in their lives. Because if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. There's hope in your pain. Because there's a savior at the tomb. There's resurrection. So how do we roll away? We be kind. Number two, we be generous. Our elders have been some of the most generous men that I've ever been around. Two years, they were my accountability team. 
They would slow me down. They would speed me up. They would pick me up. They would set me straight. They didn't say what I wanted to hear. Amy Hartman at a wedding was so used by God as she took the verse from Romans and slid it across and said, the giftings and the callings of God are without repentance. At a wedding, I didn't want to go to the wedding. Not because I didn't care about the people. It was Ashley and Richie's wedding. I wanted to be there. I loved them dearly. I just was too ashamed to face anybody. My wife, who is apparently some superwoman who is not afraid of anything, made me go. By the way, women, the drug your husband's here. Don't get caught up in the fact you had to drag him here. Be hopeful in what they can get when they get here. Parents that drug their kids here, be hopeful. We walk in there, where are we going to sit, Jordan? Where are we going to sit? There was literally, right before we walked in the wedding, somebody walked up to us and said, there are a lot of people here that don't like you, aren't there? And now I really wanted to run back to the car. We walked in and Amy Hartman from a table by herself said, over here. As soon as I sat down, slid her Bible across the table. What would happen in America if instead of meeting each other in the streets with violence, we met each other with love, with hope? Say, well, I don't agree with why they're mad. It's not your place to decide what they should be mad about. It's your place to understand that anger comes from a place of hurt. It doesn't matter what they're standing for. What matters is they're eternal. You say, well, what if they reject my love? Plant the seed and move on. Not everything you plant in the garden grows. But aren't you thankful for what actually does? There's a harvest. Be kind, be generous, be forgiving. Be a hope giver. I like that last word. I'll be done. Let him It's a hard thing to do to somebody who's codependent. It's a hard thing to do if you're the wife that's scared of losing your husband or the husband that's scared of losing your kids and wife and family. It's a hard thing to do if you're the grandma that's been praying for years. Let them go. It's a hard thing to do when you're controlling because you're so scared that if you do, your life will spiral out of control. If you've seen so much hurt in your life and you've seen so much fall apart that you come so to dependent on yourself that you feel like if you give anybody else a chance, you're going to get hurt again. Let them go. The only way the church can become active in the streets is for the pastor to stop preaching and let them go. True. The only way your kids can become successful in the Lord is at some point of your life. The Bible says they're a quiver in your hand. It's an arrow. That ain't easy to think about, is it? I mean, I want to hold on to my babies forever. But at some point, I'm going to have to walk my little girl down an aisle and let go. And I'm hoping that we've pointed that arrow in the right direction so it flies to God. Straight through his heart, but right to God. Right? But I got to let her go. And the only way you're going to be the church that you need to be is for us to make you not dependent on Grace Community Church, but to let you go. So that if this is your last Sunday here because God's leading you somewhere else, we're okay with that. It hurts. We're okay with that. If your ministry takes you across the seas, we'll be sad, but we're okay with that. If, if everything changes from this moment forward, but it's changing towards God, that's fine. But at some point, we got to let them go. In other words, we got to give up control. The thing we have them wrapped up so that we can control them has to be let loose so that God can have complete control. Some of you wives need to let go of control of needing your husband to do what you say. Parents, kids, husbands, wives, employer, employees, business owner, business. We just got to say, okay, God. I'll be obedient. He's dead and he stinks. But if you say roll the tone away and let him go, I'm going to trust you have a reason. Because the resurrection of God should not be hindered 
by the label of the church. I want to see God's power full effect. You know what I get scared of is I think when we say that in the church, we want to see the healing, the speaking in tongues, the prophecies. But God's power in full effect is people being saved and radically changed. That's his power. Addicts free, marriages restored, singles finding the love of their life through Jesus Christ. Children raised warriors of God, able to go into a world and recognize the lies they're being taught to stand firm on their identity, and your identity is not in your gender. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. Being known as people that are being raised to, to protect each other, to stand for each other, I long to see the power of God fully revealed. And you know what the power of God fully revealed is? Love. True, unconditional love. Mary and Martha have hope that if you stop trying to fix them and you trust God to do the work that you can do, you live in obedience, that your Lazarus will walk out of that tomb. You will see life reborn again. Bow your heads and close your eyes. How many Mary and Marthas are in the room today? If you slip your hand up, you know who you are. All right. Raise them high. I can't see through the lights. I'm sorry. I just want to pray for you. I don't want to extend this service longer than it needs to be, but I just want you right there where you sit to hear God's voice come to you and say, let me have them. Let me have them. Trust him. Because you can only bury Lazarus. He can raise him. You can only bury her. You can only let that hope and demon die. He can give it life. How many of you are Mary and Martha because you've given up on yourself? How many of you have yourself in a, in a tomb of condemnation? You have yourself in a label of you can't be more than you are. Would you slip your hand in the air today? Is there anybody like that? Oh, wow, they're everywhere. Hey. Hey, stop burying the possibilities of God in your unbelief and start trusting that God has a mighty plan and purpose for your life. And what today the enemy wants you embarrassed by, one day you can stand on as a platform of testimony. As I used to be dead, I used to be trapped, I used to be depressed, I used to be an addicted, I used to be an afflicted, I used to be, you fill in the blank. But now God has given me freedom. He has resurrected my life. I believe that. and I want you to believe that too. He can do it for you. He wants to. He will. You've got to trust him. Church, would you commit yourself to be in a church that fights the flesh when it comes to wanting to label the possibilities of others and opens your minds and your hearts to what God can do Can any man, woman, boy, or girl that walks through those doors, we're going to believe that as they walk through those doors, it's as if they're walking into the opportunity that God has given us to cut the rags off so that he can set them free. We need a generation of believers that truly believe that anything is possible for a person who believes. That's the Christmas story. That's what they told Mary. Anything is possible if you believe. How many of you believe God can change a life? Would you slip a hand in the air? How many of you believe that? How many of you desire to see it? How many of you want to be a part of it? Then you stop trying to fix them and grow your faith. So the next time you walk up to a tomb, you roll the stone away. The next time you meet the person that nobody loves, you roll the stone away. Because the Savior in you is going to give words, going to give opportunities, going to give power, going to give truth. He's going to use you to resurrect their lives. I believe it. And because of some of you, I'm living proof of it. And for that, I say thank you. But I challenge you, let's not stop here. There's hope. 
So roll the scandal. 